The next talk is going to be by Professor Sumitra Surendra Lal of the Symbiosis School for Liberal Arts in Pune, where she primarily teaches undergraduate physics, mathematics, and general science. So uh, again, Sumitra is no stranger to the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. So uh, she had been a participant way back in 2010 in uh, one of the complex system schools that we had organized, following which she had spent a uh, few weeks here working on some very interesting uh, networky stuff, like looking at networks of actors in various movies and what this says about social worlds as portrayed in movies and literature. Uh, subsequently, she moved on to do her PhD, again from Penn State, in conventional biophysics, modeling the syntax of bird song. Uh, following uh, finishing a PhD, she taught for a year at the Sarah Lawrence College in New York before returning to India, where she joined uh, the Symbiosis School for Liberal Arts. So Sumitra is interested in uh, mathematical modeling of complex systems and conversations around pedagogy in the sciences, especially the two cultures debate as enunciated by C.P. Snow and what it means for the undergraduate classroom. So without further ado, Sumitra. So uh, as I was just saying that I'm speaking today um, not as uh, someone who has formally studied libraries and infrastructures and histories, but uh, as an end user, as a student and a teacher uh, who has benefited from the presence of libraries, who would like get, uh, to get to experience the possibilities that libraries offer, uh, and who's convinced that uh, good libraries are crucial to a vibrant academic and community life. Uh, I worried a bit about not being able to speak from scholarship, say as a researcher of libraries, um, and that some of the things I have to say are pure, purely anecdotal. Um, as I prepared this talk, I decided, uh, to my benefit of course, that uh, perhaps there's also room for the speculative in this meeting. Uh, and um, I may end up asking more questions than providing answers about uh, the role of physical libraries in the internet era. But um, I hope you'll see it as creating space for more conversation. So the French philosopher Gaston Bachelard, uh, in his book, The Poetics of Space, uh, says that inhabited space is geometrical space. Uh, in the context of libraries too, in a geometrical sense, a library may be defined by its architectural dimensions, uh, shelving arrangements, choice of chairs and desks, uh, the physical layout, etc. But what Bachelard's assertion implies is that the essence of the library goes beyond these. Uh, and it actually lies in the subjective experiences and interactions of individuals with these geometries. Yes, the library is a place where individuals read to engage with knowledge, literature, and ideas. However, it's not just a repository of books but a living, growing space uh, that sustains the collective intellectual and emotional experiences of its users around the act of reading. Each inhabitant of the library brings their unique perspectives and interests into the space. Uh, when Bachelard wrote that inhabited space transcends geometric space, um, he was actually talking about the home. And uh, if we each, for a minute, uh, imagine our own homes, if we think of our own, our own homes, uh, our homes become lived in through our habits and idiosyncrasies. And if we each imagine our workplaces, uh, I think we feel the need to occupy different spaces. Uh, so, for example, I share my office seating space with others, uh, and I periodically feel the need to get up and just walk around in the corridor just to clear my head, uh, even if everybody is being absolutely quiet and doing their own work. Uh, at other times, I seek noisy community spaces for the pure pleasure of discussion or um, small talk and the company of others. I teach undergraduates, and the classroom is where the students and I gather to all engage in understanding the same thing. 
and for the hours that they and I occupy that space together, everything else in the world is ideally set aside. Um, all of these, I think, are important uh, to sustain my ability to do work. Digital spaces can also have nooks and corners and social functions. Um, and we find our way around them as we would in a physical space, but in a way that is unique to digital spaces. The digital library has no doubt transformed knowledge transfer, consumption, and creation, uh, largely for the good, allowing for a bigger and more diverse group of people to have access to reading material and the intellectual and social gains that come with this access. But um, I, I want to take the time I have today to emphasize that we should see the digital not as an alternative to the physical, but as different. Um, I don't mean better or worse, because depending on the particulars of what we are talking about, uh, it could go one way or another. Um, I mean different. Uh, and that this difference is substantive enough um, not to neglect the physical or the material existence and imagination of the library. The future library should not simply transform into an advanced internet cafe. Uh, when we occupy different physical spaces and interact with the material of libraries using our bodies and our senses, we can access many experiences and ways of learning that we would not be able to uh, digitally. I would also like to talk specifically about libraries in academic institutions. Public and private libraries have their own set of um, entanglements with the digital and the social, and I would say different goals and guiding principles um, that's than academic libraries. Um, and even though in the last analysis, perhaps the heart of the challenge that they face is the same as that of academic libraries, I'll try and keep the focus within academic institutions. Uh, academic institutions themselves are of different kinds. So should the primary goals of an academic institution also in some way be intentionally mirrored or imbibed by its library? Uh, that is, should all institutional or academic libraries be the same? Uh, or should a library at an undergraduate, private, liberal arts college like mine, um, in essence, be differently designed, curated, grown, and accessed uh, from very differently from, say, a library in a research institution like IMSC? I would say that there is merit to aligning the broad design of the library around the primary academic goals of the institution. Um, so when we think of and look at the college library, it's not just any place, uh, but it's a cultural symbol that holds specific values and meanings related to reading, writing, and studying, and thinking by reading, writing, and studying, and creating by reading, writing, and studying. Um, for example, I uh, know that the undergraduates in my institution are assigned a lot of collaborative group work. If the library is for studying, then my library should perhaps be keenly aware of this pedagogical need um, within a specific setting and research the needs of group learners and what the library can do to support them. Um, in some of our institutions, the library may be the only such learning space while other institutions can afford to have multiple such spaces that each function independently. So some institutions may have a separate computer lab, uh, an independent reading room, and a separation of libraries within departments, while others have one space uh, which serves or can potentially serve all these needs. So you know, perhaps we could also think of what a network of academic libraries of different kinds can accomplish in collaboration. Um, so in my classroom, uh, because I don't always have a very strict policy on mobile use, uh, I would say that the digital, through their phones, manages to smuggle in the world to my students, uh, the students whose attention I can't really keep. Uh, so I'm sure this is simply the sort of continuation of a mode uh, of being that is re regular to them in their homes, hostels, uh, and other spaces too. 
Um, I don't want to make the argument that studying printed text is necessarily better than reading something on screen. Uh, and that is why my students should be able to go to the library and open an actual book. Because uh, from a few studies I've read, I think the jury in fact seems to be out on this. Um, but I do think that shifting their place of work to the library, a space which they have socially agreed to occupy in silence, can help people intentionally cut away from some of the exhaustion uh, of constant distractions. Tactility and the use of our attention in fuller ways is also a goal that many of us today seem to have. And a recognition of this is not beyond the mandate of what a library should be concerned with. Physical libraries do offer spaces for privacy, uh, quiet contemplation and focus study. And the absence of constant digital distractions provides an environment conducive to deep thinking and reflection. Uh, but I would say that the physical library is a silent space, but it's also a social space. In the current issue of my college newsletter, a fourth year student who's about to graduate has some tips and tricks, I think mostly for the juniors, about how to manage the CA or the continuous assessment weeks. So uh, these are a staple part of their undergraduate years. These are the weeks when there are several assignment deadlines across courses. Um, term papers, mini projects, pen and paper tests, all falling in roughly the same week. So in these tips and tics, uh, tricks that she writes, uh, in her words, she says, isolation kills creativity. Finding company whom you can uh, bounce ideas off of, moreover company that motivates you, is essential. So this is from an undergraduate student, right? I think for students especially, the physical library as a social space is important. Uh, you may find people who are on the same journey as you, assignments, reading, browsing, just killing time, um, or even sleeping or taking a break. Being in the library means you can get back to work more easily than say if you go home. Um, and I don't think that the library should shy away from the um, from addressing this need to also take care of their, the social needs of students. Um, not just students, but faculty also, and others in our institutions um, whom the library supports, with regard to their ability to engage with academic work. This, I think, can be done better by making an institutional effort to bring people to the physical library, even while continuing to provide remote digital access. The guiding principle for all concepts of library space has to be the best possible response to the needs of the community the library serves and its individuals. Um, let's also not overestimate the availability of environments elsewhere for students and others to access privacy, contemplation, or social spaces. Those in an academic institution can come from a very different regional, cultural, social, and economic backgrounds. And such a space may not be prioritized outside of the library. Libraries over the centuries um, have sort of been constant in one thing that they have offered, always offered readers, which is the pleasure of accessing what they could not easily buy for themselves. Spaces for privacy, contemplation, and academic socialization have to be thought of from this perspective too. Um, we all, may also have notions about who a serious student is, uh, who a serious researcher is, uh, who a serious faculty member is. Um, and all of this, um, you know, including maybe you know, what is their reading diet and so on. So all of this may come in the way of imagining or reimagining the physical library space and also determining the kind of material and services that libraries provide access to. With regard to reading material, while I may want my students to make full use of the library, uh, maybe related to the courses that they are taking or the research that they are doing, I would also like them to be more curious about life and the world more broadly. This is not to say that every person has to and will enjoy reading fiction or general nonfiction, 
but that libraries and academic institutions should not undervalue that which, which forms a more general substrate of reading. In the things that we do, um, we can get stuck in our ways and become blind to all but those that are reinforced in our everyday. This could be about the kinds of ideas we have about the world, um, ways of thinking, paths to discovering the world, interactions with people, and our notions about ourselves. As a researcher, this could mean a narrowness to our sources of inspiration, a self-reinforcing set of sources for our work and limited perspectives. This can be true for a teacher as well and a student. So a graduate student from here I spoke to, uh, who had just begun visiting the library only recently, described the difference that the student felt when browsing books in the library and searching things on the internet. The student felt that chance encounters with new ideas and the tactility of the books mattered. With the internet, the search is directed and focused by your own query. And even the rabbit holes that you sort of choose to go down click by click are most often local transport in some way. You know how your search result is slightly different depending on whether you use Brave search engine or Google search engine. Uh, this is not to say that the experience is limited to accessing material through the internet. Uh, one can also not know where to look with books or having a, or you can have a re reading diet that effectively acts like a digital filter. However, the slowness of accessing physical material uh, can allow for some commensurately slow deliberation about information that the swiftness of the internet sort of washes out. Leafing through books in the library, especially ones that hold, um, or a library that holds rich and diverse material, um, serving the shelves is akin to traveling over large distances and allowing yourself the possibility of considering a broader range of material than what might be immediately useful. Both kinds of transport are important. So if you think of the curatorial role of the library, then the nature and quality of the curated resources actively shape what we have access to in our work and, what, um, and can have quite a lot to contribute to our sense of new frontiers. Um, academic institutions, I think, also have an ethical responsibility to kind of steward the intellectual wealth that's generated within their walls. And maintaining um, archives, physical archives, is a tangible uh, manifestation of this responsibility. Many libraries are faced with the question of what to do with the printed copies of journals and similar material in their possession uh, that they now have access to through digital subscriptions. Um, and subscriptions to back volumes as well. So these are investments in historical material that we should perhaps take a long-term view of and see from the lens of the preservation of intellectual heritage. They should both be digitized for wider access as well as materially maintained. Doing science is a human enterprise. And we can think of carefully curated material artifacts, be they letters or notebooks or memos or sketches, as entities that will help us build a picture of this enterprise. Archives are a form of wealth that belong to all of us, um, as well as future generations. We also owe transparency to the public. So if someone wants to study this enterprise and critique it, um, they, this should be possible. Ultimately, perhaps it all comes down to the economics. Uh, and I would like to suggest that the building of good physical archives seen from the perspective of ethical responsibility is not just a good, but a necessary investment. Um, so another mandate of uh, universities and research institutions is public outreach. The library can be one of the sites of outreach activities in an institution, not just because it's a built structure that simply provides a physical space for an event, but because activities can be designed to actively and mindfully involve the library and its infrastructure as part of what the institution has to offer to the public. So when I was a graduate student, I was involved in several science outreach programs of the university. Um, 
And one of the activities that I came across was part of uh, uh, what was designed by NiceNet or the Nanoscale Informal Science Education Network. So it involved pairing the reading of a book in the public uh, or the university library uh, with some science activities. So the book was Hot and Here's a Who, I don't know if any of you have read it, uh, by Dr. Seuss. Um, in it, Horton, that's Horton, and Horton is an elephant who hears a voice one day but can't see anybody to attach the voice to. Uh, so all he sees is this speck of dust. Uh, and he soon discovers that this, there is this entire city called Whoville uh, living on this speck of dust inhabited by the Who's. So he can't see them, but he knows that they exist. Uh, a reading of this story uh, is followed by an activity in which kids are shown an empty vial. Uh, it's then uncorked and they're asked to smell it and it smells really nice. They don't see anything, but there is something there for them to smell. So this activity then leads to this whole discussion about uh, the existence of entities at very small length scales uh, and uh, specifically the nano size of molecules. So there's more to this activity, but you get the idea. Um, so in this activity, firstly, there is the joy of reading aloud and drama uh, dramatic storytelling uh, to a group of young people, which in itself is an act of community building around the love for words and a great imagination. Then there is the juxtaposition of something from the sciences uh, that requires just as much imagination in saying something about entities and phenomena around us that we can't see with our eyes, but can yet discover and interact, uh, and interact with. And this is what I mean by a deliberate, insightful involvement of the library in a goal that is important to academic institutions, um, conversations with those in our communities who are not a part of the institution. So I would not limit it to public outreach alone. Um, I wonder why I, have, I haven't used the library in my own college for similar activities with my undergraduate students or with uh, colleagues from across disciplines. Of course, it doesn't have to be hot in here as a who, but something that's suitably age appropriate. Um, so many public libraries, I think Shiva spoke about this and uh, Dr. Madali also spoke about it, hold book readings and conversations with authors. Um, as a reader, I would be thrilled if academic libraries also hosted such conversations, uh, including uh, conversations with writers of academic books, even say textbooks. Um, I'm yet to attend an event where someone who has written a physics or a math book for use in an undergraduate or a graduate course uh, sits down for a chat with readers. So what is their process and how did they decide what material to include? Whom do they test all these new problems on? Who are the other actors behind the scenes who play an important role in putting such a book together? What is the academic publishing industry like? I mean, wouldn't you like to know? Um, so uh, I also think that outreach tends to be focused on getting people interested in the sciences or communicating the current work of researchers to help participants in these outreach programs be aware of interesting frontiers and the questions that the academic community is asking. But I wonder if outreach can also be extended to giving them experiences of understanding and also maybe doing a few aspects of what researchers do. As a member of the public, I would be very interested in knowing how, with so many researchers around the world working on related ideas, and so much written material being generated around these, um, how does a researcher go about building the specific body of evidence their work is built on? Or how are these citation networks generated? Uh, and uh, what are their implications? This may seem like a part of the daily grind of the academic, uh, but when seen from the point of view of an outsider, guided by the library as a mediator of knowledge, um, such engagements can be beneficial all around. Uh, we may also make the mistake of uh, thinking of academic libraries as apolitical spaces. 
By this I simply mean that they are not seats of any sort of contention regarding values or power dynamics or resource access um, or uh, you know about what kind of knowledge should be consumed or produced. But this is simply not the case. For example, we actually sort of live in some sort of illusion of far-reaching access to digitized material, uh, even in institutions with uh, very limited funding. But I suspect that the real access that we have is being hidden by individuals' ability to use sources like SciHub and LibGen uh, to procure what they need. So this is a fragile dependency that we need to recognize. Uh, with increased access, we are also bound to engage with the politics of the digital space. It will take a while for all the knowledge in the world to be digitized if it is at all possible. Even if uh, that were the case, let's also question the assumption that everything will be accessible simply because it is digitized. This is not the case even now with the digital. While the copy, cost of copying digital material is very little and uh, the material can be transmitted easily, access to the digital can be granted and taken away just as fast. From the point of view of freedom, it is also important to recognize that the preservation of digital material, depending on what we are talking about, may no longer be in the hands of the library in many ways. Um, and in many ways, libraries are beholden to companies producing and hosting the material. The digital and the physical are also intertwined in other non-trivial ways. Actually, Professor Subhaya Nachla also referred to this example in the morning. Uh, you know, to, he talked about the British Library, right? So two months ago, at the end of October, there was a ransomware attack on the British Library databases. They lost all their data, including personnel data, which uh, this was subsequently sold on the dark web. Uh, now, since library catalogs are all electronic databases uh, and user data are too, what happened was that their patrons lost access to function, um, functions like checking out physical books as well which is in some way ironical, right? You lose not just access to the digital, but through the digital to the physical. So they, there is an, an uh, you know, intertwining there um, that is not that straightforward. Finally, all libraries are the product of selection, uh, a process of selection. Faculty, other research and students may not know about the political and economic ecosystem governing the sources that we have access to and what we get to see, read, and even write about. Librarians and other library staff directly uh, work with, uh, who directly work with and who are trained in dealing with precisely these details and form a group that has a sort of zoomed out perspective on this situation, um, can educate others in an institution on the way their libraries are run. All of us in academia should pay active attention to the functioning of our academic libraries, the changes that our libraries are going through, and what our libraries' plans are for the coming years. We are not passive actors in this scenario whose engagement with or the lack thereof has no consequences for libraries, but we actively shape their future forms, what is taken forward and what is left behind. If we see the physical library only uh, as a place where information is stored for retrieval, we may not see why the continuation of its physicality should be any concern of ours. Students especially can make a difference to what the physical library can evolve into in an academic institution. Um, in general, I think there is a need to preserve as well as create as many spaces as possible within colleges, universities, and research institutions that give its members a sense of self and of belonging to a community interested in intellectual activity. Um, students should therefore uh, be involved in what is happening at their library uh, and also actively interact with librarians, library staff, faculty, and the administration about what actually matters to their academic well-being and how the library can support them in achieving this. Uh, so I'll end here, but I wrote most of what I've said today sitting in the IMSE library because I've been visiting for a few days. 
I've grown particularly fond of this spot on the second floor with a writing desk and chair right near the large windows, you know, from which you can see the rain tree. Um, so Dr. Pandian, uh, I told you this when I met you, but I'll say this again. Uh, I'm told that you're responsible for setting up the RFID system in the library. Um, that the one here that allows anyone with an access card to visit the library even after hours and on holidays. Um, I just want to say that I've benefited uh, from it during my time here at IMSE. Um, apart from, of course, being able to uh, browse through the wonderful collection of books that's housed here. Uh, so, Dr. Pandian, I wish you a wonderful retirement. Uh, your working years with the libraries um, have coincided with a period of great changes in how we access knowledge. Um, and I hope you'll write about your experiences for a general reader. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Yeah. Questions, comments? Yeah. First of all, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Very colorful, I would say. Okay. You use some of those paintings and things like that. And only one question that I have is, what's your view on this entire research? About libraries, stop thinking about the library space. Are they happy with the library space? What they get as a workplace? You are I talking about library users. I haven't asked enough. You need enough. to look at that angle as well. Okay. Because for library users, it's a different place. Library right. stop, it's a different space. Mm -hmm. Do they like it? Do they have all facilities, what they are looking for? Maybe that could also be addressed next time when you speak. Just a suggestion. Sure. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed the paintings oh, okay. more than the talk. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, you have Manjit Bhava, but uh, you never thought about Amrita Shergil? Uh, Amrita Shergil? Yeah. So does Amrita Shergil have something with books and libraries? This was my... <laughs> that, I, I'm not sure. Okay. But sh she's a big name. Maybe you could use... So I, I've not yet <laughs> found an Amrita Shergil with a, uh, you know, with a book or anything to do with libraries, but uh, yeah. yeah. Actually, the editor of the Journal of Information Science, okay. actually the founder editor, is a great fan of Amrita Shergil. Okay. So I have been trying to get some of the reproductions, not the original, of course, mm -hmm. for a long time. Even Lalitha Kala Academy doesn't have them. Okay. Shame. You know, this uh, point that you raised about actually preserving the physical mm -hmm. along with the digital is something that has come up in my previous interactions with Dr. Paul Pandian. So uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, I'm actually the more conservative guy. I think the physical should be preserved. Uh, although I do get his argument that, you know, uh, we probably don't have space to preserve all the physical. But, uh, you know, this is something that I discussed with uh, a visitor from Spain uh, who also is in the library committee of his library of his university and he pointed out that we have no clue about the perishability of the digital uh, you know like for all we know this you know all this digital media could be much more fragile than the paper so you know without knowing like how long they can last should we just you know summarily get rid of all the physical so um, you know based on this argument of how much space we got and, you know, uh, is it something worth getting into this, this argument about should we just summarily discard all the physical? Uh, I think Professor Nachalam has a comment. Right this morning, I have brought a laptop and it couldn't be connected. So they wanted to take it on a pen drive. The pen drive that they have wouldn't slug into my, um, the whole provider for that. I mean, there's no standardization. Okay. I have a three pin plug for charger. It doesn't go into this. So I have to use an adapter. So technology uh, is never the solution. Because different places and different times have different technologies. So especially after the huge collapse in the British, British Library in London, uh, two months, and since they are not able to uh, bring back the services, it's a big shame, technology, ransomware. So depending entirely on technology is stupid. So we need to, the days may be modern, we may have all the computers, skills, and so on. But I think go ahead with the technology. 
But retain your paper. Retain. So, you know, maybe I'll uh, no, go off by kind of saying that, you know, I hope I made the point that, uh, uh, so I, I'm definitely not saying that, you know, the digital should be done away with or not engaged with. That I'm simply saying that it is a different medium and it's a different medium uh, with a lot of benefits. Uh, right. But the physical experience is different and it's just not something that we should undervalue or just completely throw out of the window. During my session in the morning, I talked about digitizing Times of India as a newspaper right from the beginning. Yeah. Even though we have advanced technology, digital archive, everything is working properly. We still maintain the original bound volumes intact in a less costly location. We are maintaining the microfilm source also as it is, including positives as well as negatives, and digital archive also with the remote backup. Because you never know when we will lose a digital collection. And these are rare copies, you will not get it from anywhere. Similarly, that applies to any institution. If you have got an hard copy archive, <coughs> Even though if you digitize them, you should find a less costly location to preserve them and keep it forever. Because once you lose your digital collection, if you don't have a original source, you will never get it. Because these have been maintained for hundreds of years by different set of people. Yeah. You will never get it. Thank you. I, I, can I, just one last thing, which is that um, I also, you know, I was trying to see uh, what is driving the sort of, in academic institutions, um, thinking about switching to digital, right? Is it on the basis of, so as a teacher, I'm interested in when students are actually reading material, does it actually make a difference when they read and print and read in text in terms of what it means for cognition and so on, right? So I'm not sure that a lot of these decisions are being made on the basis of what it means for learners. Uh, it, they, it, I mean, there is a, I, at least in the Indian higher education context, maybe I don't know where to look, but I don't see enough studies being done on what this means before these changes are made. And a lot of the changes seem to be driven by economic arguments and other larger institutional policies, but not really thinking about what it means for learning. And it would be really nice if libraries can support this sort of work that feeds into their own um, evolution as well. Yeah. And in, and in this context, specifically a student and what it means for learning, yeah. There was a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the presentation was really good. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. And uh, myself, Kalpana from Indian Statistical Institute. I am from library profession. From a professional side and from a end user side, mm -hmm. both way I think that uh, digital collections are really distractful. Okay. Because I will, I'll get a comfort and uh, read the content without distraction from a physical book, and I will never get this experience from a digital uh, screen. And it is, see my specs. No. I think everybody is uh, used to the specs at a very younger age, only because of the screen size, uh, space. So this was not the case actually uh, in uh, older generations. So this is the thing, right? Like, so I'm not sure if that's the way to think about this completely, right? So, uh, and I'd still maybe go back and re-emphasize this, that I think depending on what you want to do with the library or with the, the material, the digital may be better than the physical or the physical may be better than the digital. Right? It really depends on what you want to get out of it, right? And that we have both possibilities is important and it's important to kind of retake. So uh, from my uh, usage or from my experience, I'll use all the search things for from the digital environment. But once I locate it, I'll go to the physical version and read it. Okay. So this is also something I think we don't know enough about, which is that how are users, library users, actually interacting with the physical and the digital library, right? Like what are the use patterns? What, how are our students actually using our library and resources? So here are you know, more questions that somebody should be looking at and working on. Yeah. And uh, the last solution I used to take a printout of any chapters or uh, journal articles, then I'll read it from the print. Because I had, a, I had to get a better option at least to save my eyes. Yeah, it's what, you know, it's what you're used to, right? Uh, my students who are digital natives may be used to a very different mode. And so, you know, maybe I need to figure out uh, you know, what the exact same thing means for them as well. Yeah. So definitely coexistence is the need of the art. Absolutely. Yes, I want to you know, summarize this. 
So this debate can go on forever. You know, there are two set of debates. Some old generation people, they even even today, I would say that I would like to read a fiction only as an hard copy. Long reads. It's better to read a book. But if you are looking for something as a quick reference material, yeah. use the digital archive or digital tool as a uh, retrieval tools. You can download, search, maybe take a printout and read. But the other point she made was, trying to make was, like if you got into an, any online source, you are reading something, suddenly something pops up. Mm -hmm. Then you will get into that link. You will forget what you actually wanted to do. Then you will go on to some other link. That distraction is always there when you go to online. You will be watching something on YouTube, an interesting video, something else will come up. Then you will forget about your real purpose. That one need to avoid, that depends upon your own temperament and mentality. For that, there is no solution. Thank actually, you. Actually, while my entire talk was anecdotal, uh, so, uh, but I think all of these are anecdotal, right? And uh, I think I'm just advocating that we need to systematically and academically study this before we are able to kind of make those switches.